All right, welcome to part one of our introduction to culture lecture. In this one, we're going to focus on what are local and popular cultures. The slides are designed to accompany the textbook People, Places, and Culture, and I am, of course, Ms. Gall, and I'll be your host for the lecture. So when we talk about what are local and popular cultures, the first thing we need to do is define that term culture. And when we're defining culture, there's lots of different definitions that go around. Okay, for our purposes, what we're going to do is use culture to mean a group of belief systems, norms, or values practiced by by a people. Okay, so belief systems, that's pretty straightforward. What do you believe in? Okay, um, typically we associate that with religion. Norms, on the other hand, if you're um, not reasonably well educated, norms are the... Um, basically approved actions. One of the one of the kids earlier today phrased it that way and I love that. The approved actions are ways of doing things. Okay. And values are just what are the priorities? What's important to a group of people? So we're looking at all of these things. What do people believe in? How do they act? What do they value? What's important in a group of people? So that's kind of the what is a culture. And then when we talk about the who because we can use culture as both a verb and as a noun, right? So when we talk about the who, the noun definition of culture is that the group of people who we call a culture, really we, rec we can recognize that in one of two ways. The first way is that they could call themselves a culture, right? So for instance, most of the people in the United States would refer to themselves as being part of the American culture, right? Or would refer to themselves as American. And with that comes the, the culture. So that's one way is self-definition. Right? The other way is that other people, outside people, including academics, so for academics or things like college professors, okay, could label a certain group of people as a culture. Most of you guys are in high school. I doubt very much though that you would bother to think of yourselves as being part of teen culture, even if you self-identified as teenager. Okay, so when we're talking about the other people doing the identifying, if, an, if a college professor, say a psychology professor or sociology professor, were to come in and wanted to take a look at um, how teenagers act, they would see you as part, being part of teen culture, right? Actually, I guess it would be an anthropology professor because anthropologists, anthropologists are the ones that study culture. But they would label you as being part of teen culture, even though that's not a label you would take on for yourself. Okay. So now we're going to talk about three different types of culture. And really, I feel like the folks who put these slides together got it a little bit backwards because I feel like folk and local culture probably should have been talked about um, in the other order. But we're going to start with folk culture because that's what they start with. Okay, And folk cultures are small. They incorporate a homogeneous population, homogeneous just another way of saying people who share a lot of common characteristics. Okay, Typically they're rural and they're cohesive in their cultural traits. So they stick together as part of their culture. Okay, um, And this is in direct opposition to popular culture, which is large, which incorporates heterogeneous populations. So people who are very, very different. Okay is typically urban, or at least it gets its start in urban areas for the most part, and it experiences quickly changing culture traits. So folk culture takes a lot of time to change. Popular culture, not so much. Popular culture is constantly changing and updating and doing the next latest greatest new thing. Right, so we want to talk about some examples of folk culture, and we'll do a little bit more with this uh, in the next lecture. We talk about folk cultures being, for example, Native American tribes are examples of folk culture. Even if they're not always rural, they are isolated in a way you, that's more common typically in rural areas, right, when we talk about the reservation system. We could also, the um, one of the biggest examples of folk culture are things like the Amish or Hutterites, right, Anabaptists. So these are groups of people who have chosen to separate themselves from the mainline culture, who have very clearly distinct beliefs that in some ways contradict those of um, popular culture, the, the dominant culture. They live in rural areas. It's a very cohesive, tight-knit group. Um, typically, they're very, very small. I don't remember how large in the case of Amish communities they allow themselves to get, but it's not very big. Okay, 
popular culture, on the other hand, this is, especially if you're a teenager here in the U.S., you live and breathe popular culture. You probably don't even think about pop culture, right? Pop culture is um, Gwen Stefani on The Voice. Pop culture is Snapchat on your phone. Pop culture is whatever the coolest, latest way to dress is. This is pop culture. It changes. It changes all the time. It often gets its start in urban places, not surprisingly, because that's where a lot of the people are. And pop culture spreads out, right? That's its goal is to, even though it, it involves heterogeneous populations, basically what it does is homogenizes. It makes everything the same. All right, so if we wanted to bring in an analogy from one of the previous units that we studied, and we talked about cities, right? If you talk about cities and suburbs and we talk about placelessness with suburbs, placelessness is that idea that places look alike and there's not much that's distinct. We see it applied a lot to suburbs, especially here in the United States. Um, popular culture is like that. It kind of makes groups of people all the same. Okay. Whereas um, local cultures, which is our next slide here really, local cultures are groups they're what make places unique and different so it's a group of people in a particular place and that place piece is key okay who see themselves as a community who share experiences customs traits so in other words they they have commonalities right and they work to preserve those traits or customs in order to be able to claim their uniqueness and to distinguish them from others Okay, we talk about local cultures. Local culture is everything from, for instance, the culture in a classroom is a very localized culture. It's very small. My classroom is what, probably 30 feet by 30 feet, something like that, 30 feet by 40 feet, something like that. So it's very small. Okay. Um, two, it could be part of a city. For example, we live not far from Seattle. And if we look in Seattle, for instance, the university district has a very distinct localized culture or, um, the international district has a very distinct local culture, right? So it could be parts of cities. There's a local culture that is just more the broad Seattle culture, right? Or we talk about, say, Portland culture. And if we were talking about Portland, some of the distinguishing uh, traits might be an emphasis on public transit, on um, rideability. In other words, the ability to ride your bike to and from places, right? So these are things that people try to claim and make unique. The other way I like to think about this too, if we're talking about local versus popular culture, one of the big aspects of culture that people are probably most familiar with is food. And when we're talking about local culture and we want to talk about food, right here in Seattle, we have um, Dick's Burgers. Dick's very popular local chain, um, mostly in the Seattle area or I should say mostly, it is in King County, basically. Somebody said there was one up in Edmonds, but you know, that's a little bit north of Seattle. But the point is it's all in the Seattle area, right? So it's very much a part of local culture. If we were gonna talk about Yakima, Washington, we could talk about minor burgers, right? And you don't get a minor burger in Seattle because they don't have a branch here, but it's very much a part of, go of Yakima culture is that you go to minor burgers. Or if we're talking about Portland, we could talk about Voodoo Donuts or Powell's Books, right? These are all aspects of local culture. And this is in direct contradiction to popular culture and the popular culture alternative to a minor burger or Dick's Burger is like McDonald's, Burger King. I can go anywhere and get a McDonald's or Burger King burger. But if I want a Dick's Burger, I gotta be in Seattle to get it because I'm not gonna get it in Anchorage and I'm not gonna get it in Houston and I'm not gonna get it anywhere else. Okay, so local cultures are kind of, I tend to think of them as kind of that mid-level. They embrace parts of popular culture, but really they're trying to kind of push back against popular culture and trying to maintain that uniqueness, that sense of identity in a way that um, popular culture is constantly pushing against. Right? And folk cultures are the most insular of all. And their folk cultures, by the way, are distinct type of popular, or blah, sorry, a distinct type of local cultures. So that's why really if I were organizing this, I would have done um, local culture first and then pop culture and then folk culture or pop culture first, then local, then folk. Because folk culture really falls under this rubric of local culture. 
Okay. Um, one other thing we want to cover, and this is the last slide on the PowerPoint, by the way, but we do need to talk a little bit about the what of culture. Okay. So we've talked about who forms a culture. We've talked about the how, right, the verb piece. So we've got verbs and nouns. And now we're talking about kind of the what, like what is what of culture. So we, we split this into, by the way, two distinct categories. We talk about material culture and non-material culture. Material culture is um, things that people construct, things like art, houses, clothing, sports, dance, food. Um, I like to think of it, for the most part, material culture is things you can lay your hands on. They're things you can actually touch. Not 100% of the time, but something in the neighborhood 80-90% of the time. Material culture is something you can actually physically touch. You can see it. You can smell it, taste it, right? It's something that you can get your hand on. Non-material culture, on the other hand, it's a little more, for lack of a better term, fluffy. Right? It's kind of like trying to grab a cloud. I can't quantify, I can't grab a hold of, touch belief systems. I can't really grab a hold of touch practices, right? Aesthetics, which is really a fancy schmancy way of saying what's pretty, right? What's attractive. Um, I can't, can't grab or touch or quantify values of a group. And so these are very distinct aspects of culture that we look at and we need to look at when we're talking about culture and how we see it on the cultural landscape, right? So Material culture is obviously the easiest to see on the cultural landscape because it's that physically constructed stuff, but it's influenced by the non-material culture, right? So um, nobody knowingly builds a house that they think is but ugly, okay? Um, nobody builds a temple to a religion they don't believe in, okay? This is what I'm talking about. So when we look at the cultural landscape, what we see is the material culture, but it's influenced by the non-material culture. So if you have any questions, please feel free to get back to me and bring them into class and I'd love to answer them. I will be posting up a part two to this lecture because we did it all as one big lecture in class. So keep an eye out for that sometime in the next day or so and I will See you the next time we meet.